Hello, I'm Felicity Cohen. I'm so excited to introduce you to my Wellness Warriors podcast. For over 20 years, I've been a passionate advocate for helping thousands of Australians find solutions to treating obesity and health-related complications through surgical intervention and holistic managed care. My podcast is dedicated to all the people, past, present and future, who have helped shape my journey and continue to inspire me to work consistently to achieve a healthier Australia in both adults and future generations. I hope you enjoy it. Good morning, Tom Cronin. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you today to my Wellness Warriors podcast. Thank you so much for coming on and joining me. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me along, Felicity. It's nice to be here. So there's so much for us to talk about. Um, I had the pleasure of watching the portal um, over last weekend. It was fascinating. And your career and your work that you're doing in the area of mindfulness, meditation and coaching is vast. But before we get into that and dive into all of these wonderful things that you do for so many people, um, I'm really curious to know, first of all, I believe you grew up on a farm. Is that correct? I did. I was actually there two days ago. The same Where, farm. Whereabouts? It's about an hour and half, an hour and a half out of Sydney on the southwestern side, a place called Thirlmere. It's a really small little town that has like three shops. And um, we have 20 acres on our farm. The house is actually one of the oldest homes in the area. It's about 200 years old. It's one of the first homesteads and it's a beautiful old sort of cottage that we've kind of expanded on. And um, mum and dad, over the years, you know, we've been there for 50 years. We've sort of built these gorgeous, you know, gardens all around the property. So there's oak trees and elm trees and rose walks. It's very, very um, picturesque and very pretty. What a beautiful place to still be able to go back to and to escape to in this day and age. Yeah, so blessed. You know, I was just down the hill the other day. There's a beautiful valley and there's kangaroos and wallabies and all sorts of wildlife. So it's... um you know, such a blessing that we're not that far from Sydney and I can sort of access this place, which is so peaceful and, you know, natural. So growing up in an environment like that, what led you or drove that desire for you to work in the area where you were eventually living in New York and spent so many years on Wall Street? What were some of the things from that early stage of life that drove those decisions for you? Well, first thing I want to clarify, I, I didn't actually live in New York. I spent time in New York um, and LA. My career was like a wolf of Wall Street broker, but it was actually based in Sydney on the trading room floors of Sydney. Um, and it was on the global markets, you know, that were traded around the world. But it was actually strangely by default. It was not something that I'd planned at all. Uh, I, tr I took a year off after high school to backpack around the world and I was traveling on trains across Europe and America. And um, reading books by Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus about French existentialism and I wanted to become a journalist and write articles about capitalistic greed and I was you know listening to Susie and the Banshees and the Smiths and was really anti-establishment in my teenage years and when I got back before university started I just applied to a bunch of jobs in the paper because I needed some money and one of them lo and behold was on a trading room floor and uh I literally was just going to turn up for a few months before uni started. I had uh, got back in November and uni didn't start until March. So I had a bit of time up my sleeve to save some money. And before long, I was given a very substantial salary. Uh, I was given a corporate Amex card and I was given a sports car as a fringe benefit. So I kind of like, well, this is pretty cool. So I just put uni off for another year and was going to go back the next year. And at the end of that year, I got another pay rise and bonuses and the next year and the next year. And 26 years later, I was spent on a trading room floor. That's a very long time. You've actually <laughs> just um, reminded me one of my favourite authors is Albert Camus. So I love, uh, um, I grew up reading re reading those books. So Your pronunciation is a lot better than mine. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so tell me a little, a little bit about that 26 years. It was uh, it sounds like it's such a high, intense pressure cooker type of environment where you're on 24-7 for your clients. Yeah, it's pretty intense. You know, you, by day, you know, there's split second decisions. You're turning over billions of dollars of swaps and bonds on international markets. Um, you know, most parcels that we would be trading would be anything between five, 10 and 20 million dollars. Um, some of the bigger tickets would be 50 to 100 million dollars, and every now and then you get a 200 million dollar trade. Um, so, 
you know, you, you're moving around big money for traders around the world and you've got to really be on point the whole time. So it's quite adrenaline fueled. Yeah. And then at night time, a big part of the job was to actually make sure that you developed really good relationships and rapport with the clients so that um, obviously, you know, they were good guys, but also so that you would be able to get the business. And um, it was just a night and day type job. So it was pretty intense. You know, you're working uh, on and running on adrenaline for a lot of the time. Is that one of the things that drove you in that role? Did you love that adrenaline high? Loved it. I yeah. loved it night and day. I, you know, daytime, I love the the excitement and the, you know, it was just intense, you know, all day. And then nighttime and weekends, you know, I, I loved just a fast paced life. You know, that's what I was very addicted to. I guess also the financial rewards that were coming at such an early age would have been also quite um, addictive to a certain degree as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're on a quarterly bonus system. So every three months, you know, on top of your salary, you'd get a bonus based upon your performance. And, um, you know, for any young 19 year old, 20 year old, 21 year old is quite phenomenal to see that sort of money coming into your bank account. So it was uh, very charming and alluring for the ego. Totally get it. It would have been very exciting. Um, what are some of the biggest things that you learnt from your time on the trading room floor that you actually feel like you have translated or um, utilised now in, in your work today? <laughs> Gosh, it's, I'm going to have to really think hard here. <laughs> um, look, you know, you had to be resilient. You had to let things go. Uh, you know, you couldn't afford to have um you know grudges you know if you if you got in a beef with someone like you had to move on from that very very quickly not that you know as a meditation teacher i have lots of beef with people but it was that adaptability which was key being very adaptable you know in every single moment and one of the things we need in the world right now is increased adaptive capacity and what's causing so much stress in our world is the inability to increase our adaptive capacity. So we've got a demand for increased adaptive capacity, but we don't have increased adaptive capacity. And that there lies, that big gap there is what's causing so much stress and overwhelm in our world. Overwhelm is a massive problem right in the here and now, and it's something that I think we deal with you know, every day. It doesn't matter. I don't think where you sit, where you are, what you're doing, it, it's part of the world we actually live in. Um, learning how to manage it and deal with it, that's a whole other story. But I think it's a it's part of the the world that we're faced with right now. Um, how do you think you actually dealt with overwhelm when you were actually on the trading room floor? What were some of the strategies? Did you have strategies then? I didn't have any strategies. And, you know, what we used as a tool for stress at the end of the day was drinking. And, you know, let's root the band up and, and be transparent, you know, drugs, you know, we took drugs, we drank, and that was just part of our stress release mechanism. But of course, what that was doing was compounding the stress response in the body, because we're putting our nervous system under extreme duress. So it's under extreme duress in the day. And then to let off steam, we put it under extreme duress in the night. And so this compounding effect eventually led for, to me to a, a huge stress response in the body, which was overwhelming. So at what point, I mean, 26 years is a really long time. At what time or what point, what was the delineating moment for you that was telling you, I need to change, this has got to stop for me? Yeah, it was, it was about 10 years in and there'd been this accumulation of stress responses happening in my body. You know, it started to really accumulate in, in anxiety, depression, panic attacks, insomnia, even agoraphobia, constantly colds and sick. Um, and it just eventually morphed into a quite a severe sort of nervous breakdown at the age of 29. So it was in that time that I was in this, what we call in Sanskrit, a rashi. A rashi is a, uh, a sort of like a crisis moment where you reach a fork in the road where there's only two options at that point. You can't continue on sustaining the same status quo. So relationships, businesses, companies, civilizations get to that fork in the road where things either break down or break through. And so they either evolve to a higher level of order and cohesiveness or they break down and completely collapse. And that's into divorce, bankruptcy, suicide or death, whatever. So there's a, there's a point where things can't continue on anymore and it's definitive, a change must occur. And so for me, that happened at 29. And luckily I broke through. And what that looked like was uh, the universe or divinity or whatever you want to call it had transpired where 
I discovered meditation through a documentary that I was watching. And that was like a light bulb moment for me that was like, hey, this is something you really should start looking into. And so that's when I started to use meditation as a tool for stress management and everything changed from there. So the first 10 years of my career was using tools for stress management that weren't very sustainable. And the next 16 years of that career were using tools that were very sustainable and allowed me to have a very successful career. With meditation, I think a lot of people will wonder if it's something that they can actually, how do they do it? How do they start? What are the mechanisms? It, it, sometimes I think for people who've never tried it, it sounds quite intangible. Um, how did you actually get yourself into that mode of being able to successfully practice meditation? I think like anything, you know, if you learn from a qualified practitioner, teacher, um, you're going to get a better result. So I went and visited a qualified teacher that was going to teach me. A lot of people kind of winging it. They might read a book or they might, you know, just try and sit and close their eyes and empty their mind. I learned a technique that was very effective and very efficient, and that's the one that I've been teaching and using for 25 years. Uh, and it was just a game changer for me. It was very quick and very efficient that I went into that state of meditation and I had quite a quite a tangible and distinct experience that was was like, okay, there's something here that's working and therefore I'm going to keep using this. And that's what I think is really important when we're using a technique that it's something that we can definitively say, yes, I noticed there's a change here. And we should notice that usually within, you know, one to two weeks. For me, it was literally within days. I could see that something significant was starting to change and happen. And then that was simply because of the technique that I learned from a qualified teacher. Did you actually go and do an immersive training program or was it just this ongoing journey of, of training and practicing? Um, what The way I learned it is it was over four sessions. So you, you, you get this mantra or sound and you learn how to meditate using the sound and they give you the science and the mechanical sort of understanding about the technique. Uh, and all of that knowledge is really important is to knowing what's happening during your meditation, knowing how to meditate. And that four session program is really the starting point. And from there, you can go off on your own, you're self-sufficient to meditate on your own, or you can get ongoing support with the teacher. And that's one thing that I offer as well with my students. And what my teacher offered was that I could continue to go to these group sessions and get further knowledge and support and inspiration um, from that ongoing support with the teacher. So what are some of the things that you felt changed through that second phase of your career? You had that changing moment and, and the next 10 years where you were actually using meditation as opposed to, you know, drugs, alcohol and other mechanisms for stress release. Did you feel like you had this? Was, did it change your brain chemistry? Did it change your stress response? How did it alter the relationships in your workspace? It changed everything. Uh, it literally was a game changer. The first things that started to change was that because when when I was um, pre-meditation, I was in an ongoing sustained state of sympathetic nervous system. And so what that means is that I'm in a fight flight continuously day in, day out. And when we're in fight flight, which is a body's response to protect you from danger, your biochemical changes dramatically. So what you won't produce when you're in fight flight is oxytocin, the biochemical for love, serotonin, the biochemical for happiness, melatonin, the biochemical for sleep because your body's trying to keep you alert and protected from danger. So if you're on the front line in the battlefield, you don't want to be falling asleep. You don't want to be feeling compassion and empathy. You don't want to be feeling happiness. You want to be on high alert, ready to potentially kill someone or something if it's a threat to your survival. And so I was in sympathetic nervous system state for a long time, deficient of these wonderful biochemicals that make you feel healthy and happy and whole. But when I started meditating, immediately those biochemicals because I went from sympathetic to parasympathetic which is the peace response so firstly I started sleeping which was phenomenal I just did, it was a whole new phenomenon to be able to go to sleep within literally minutes it normally would take me one to two hours um, I started feeling lighter happier less responsive less agitated less anxious mm -hmm. and just generally started to feel healthier and happier and then because I was healthier and happier I started making very different choices in my life as to this sort of decisions I was making about, uh, you know, um, the things that I was doing and what I was feeling called to do. Let's talk about sleep for a moment, because I think that's a massive problem. I talk to people every day and I know in myself, I'm not, a, I'm not the great world's greatest sleeper. Um, I hate to admit that, but I'm not very good at it. And so 
Um, and, and, you know, insomnia in general and sleep behaviour problems that can lead to other health conditions or interrelated to other health conditions, I think is such a massive problem. Um, how do you use meditation? How do you teach people that they don't actually have to use substance abuse or other mechanisms to allow them to sleep? And how, how does this work? How does it help you mm. get yourself into that state where sleep is a reality? Yeah, it's, it is a big issue and it's great that you've brought this up because it's probably one of the greatest epidemics we're struggling with on the planet right now is poor sleep and the ramifications of poor sleep on our health and happiness. Um, there's two things going on with sleep. One is the biochemistry. So that's just simply just not having enough melatonin in the body because the body's in a hyper-stimulated state, so fight flight. And when we're in fight flight, the body's saying, hey, this is dangerous. I don't want you to go to sleep right now, just in case the saber tooth tiger comes out from around this rock. So because we don't realize that we've morphed into this sustained state of sympathetic nervous system state, that we're deficient in melatonin, we're just not producing enough of it at the right times. So that's the first thing is just being in the world that we're in right now, we're not producing enough of the melatonin to help us sleep. The second thing is our mental state. So we, we, what we're doing is we're fueling an apparatus to be incredibly stimulated and not just stimulated, but be insatiable for knowledge and information. And it's like a kid in a candy store. It just, it just can't get enough. And so what we're doing is we're not teaching our mind how to stop thinking. And meditation plays two roles when it comes to sleep. Firstly, we don't need to use meditation to go to sleep. You will naturally learn how to go to sleep as a result of you meditating on a daily basis. One is that if you get in the rhythm of the day and you start to realize that as the sun sets, you start to wind down your day, you have some food, you start to prepare for bed, you turn out your technology, turn out your lights, turn out all of the things that are stimulating your nervous system around 9, 9.30 ideally, then by 10 o'clock, ideally your body should be so sort of saturated in melatonin that the moment you put your head on the pillow there should be a nice beautiful uh you know going out into the deep state the deep sleep state the second thing is um that the mind's uh continuous sort of hunger for thinking when we meditate we have greater autonomy and greater control over the mind so when, when one of the things that blew me away when i put my head on the pillow was that i could simply say to your mind okay we're not going to think now because I'd trained my mind, I I trained my mind to do what I wanted it to do. It's like a, a horse or a dog that hasn't had no discipline, right? But if you're regularly disciplining your horse or your dog, then it's going to be a lot more receptive to your instructions. And the mind, for most of us, is like a wild bucking bronco that we've done no training for it. And daily meditation, twice a day, really, gives you greater autonomy, greater capacity, greater freedom to choose what your mind's going to do as opposed to your mind dictating what it's going to do. So let's move on to talk a little bit more about stress and stress in the workplace and, and how we can use meditation in that environment. And I can see that you've been an incredible advocate for using meditation in a whole range of different sectors um, in the finance sector and um, teaching people. Have you been back to the um, to the floor and, and taught people how they can actually self manage and you know use this to turn the negative stress into a positive by utilizing meditation and how do we use more meditation to manage our stress our anxiety and depression mm. look you simply will have less stress so we've got to understand that stress is not a situation a lot of people say oh that must be stressful or that must have caused stress so what we have is just a situation black and white it's, a, it's, it's purely objective and then we have the subject, which is the relationship you have with that situation, and that's the variable. So you can have a stress response to a situation or you don't have a stress response to the situation, regardless of what the situation is. It's, it's purely subjective. And what meditation does is it reduces that response and that reactiveness to world circumstances. And so it allows you to have greater freedom to be in the world and not be thrown around and influenced by it. So that's the first thing, just understanding that stress is a response, it's not a situation. And that's the variable that we have here that we get to play with, which is really exciting because it means we can do something about this. Secondly, um, yeah, I've been not back to that actual trading room floor that I work on. Um, that's probably not been a calling yet from them to have a collective meditation experience. 
but I have been working with a lot of companies that have been looking to implement meditation programs and they're realizing how important this is because when they, their staff meditate, they have less stress response, which means they get better brain productivity, better brain functionality, less sick absenteeism, better relationships, everything's just better. And so I've been working with Amazon, Coca-Cola, Qantas, Union Bank of Switzerland, Finch Media, Nova FM, you know, CBA, multiple uh, hundreds of companies to help them integrate a particular program on a daily basis where staff are entitled and allowed to meditate. And we're seeing companies that do this, it's phenomenal the results that they're getting. And it's the, a lot of companies are still a bit slow to pick this up, partly because most people in general are a bit slow to pick this up, but it will start to accelerate quite quickly, we'll see. I love that and it's something I'm really keen to implement in my own work environment here. Um, I've decided that we're going to do a, mon a group Monday morning, you know, mm, meditation session together to kickstart the week and set our intentions for the week. And I think that's really valuable that you've got people who are willing to recognise that their employees are going to feel better, do better, be more productive, but you're also doing something so positive for them at the same time and giving them skills that they can apply, obviously, outside of the workplace. Which yeah, is really I I, I, you know, that's fantastic and congratulations for doing that. It's going to make a big difference. I, I've seen companies in Oprah Winfrey's whole company at nine o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock in the afternoon, they all stop for 20 minutes and everyone meditates. And she said it's been a complete game changer. So if it ever gets to a point where you want to ramp that up to the next level, at least I'd implement an afternoon meditation to allow people that little window of time to have a bit of reprieve from their computers, from their work and to clear their mind of clutter and reset themselves. So it could be anything from two, three or four o'clock in the afternoon where, and it doesn't even have to be 20 minutes, it could be as short as 10 minutes, but anything between 10 and 20 minutes where there's just a structured, hey guys, if anyone wants to take a break, I'm gonna meditate if anyone wants to join me in the boardroom. Or, and it's just recognized that that particular time every day in that company, there's, a, there's the allowance to take some time out. Hey, they're gonna get a smoker or a cappuccino anyway so you may as well give them some sort of window of time that's going to be a lot more wholesome and healthy yeah i love it and i really think that maybe long term maybe there needs to be a push for eventually a medicare item number or some access where so we can, you know have gps and doctors refer to medic meditation coaches um as a you know a funded solution that's going to be you know quite life-changing and could prevent so much more in the space of disease when, when it comes to, you know, all this collective amount of whatever's related to this, you know, anxiety, depression, stress disorders. It, it, it's, it's not recognised at this point in time as something that we can refer to um, or include as a, I guess, mainstream opportunity, but it really should be. Well, that could take us down a big rabbit hole. There's one thing that uh, hasn't been extremely promoted in our current world is how to be healthy and happy. What's promoted quite aggressively is how to be unhealthy and unhappy because <laughs> that's really good business. So um, I'd be very surprised if we see that, but it'd be great if we did. Um, but at the moment, the system really inspires an unhealthy existence. It's, that's a tragedy and you know hopefully there's more people doing as much as possible to counteract that kind of environmental situation yeah look i mean we just have to look at the current situation that we're in right now we're not seeing very simple protocols for people to boost their immune system you know collectively in the mainstream media and in in, in even in the medical professions to yeah. really help people stay uh extremely healthy and extremely uh strong mentally physically and emotionally through the, through this time but i think you know in the future we'll hopefully we'll see that happen how has your work um changed and what have you seen that's been radically different for you over the last 12 to 18 months especially being in sydney um a long-term lockdown and communicating with your clients have you tell me a little bit about some of the changes that you've seen and how have you managed to address it yeah, you know, one thing that I do with my clients is teach them how to have adaptable businesses that allow you to almost be fireproof through these difficult times. You know, obviously gyms, yoga studios, you know, they're really at the mercy of a collective decision-making process that disempowers them. 
Um, and so, you know, with my business as well, you know, we run retreats, I do corporate programs, I do speaking events. So um, a large portion of, well, a portion of my business was compromised. You know, we just cancelled a almost sold out retreat in, in Byron Bay, which was about to happen next month. And so we have to be adaptable. We have to sort of roll with the times, but also for me, um, pivoting the business into a format that allows it to sustain itself. So, you know, most of my business is coaching online in groups and one-on-one. Oh, I'd actually love to go to one of your retreats one day. So hopefully that will open mm -hmm. up again soon. Yeah, likewise. Um, so the, the portal, what an incredible project. And I would love to hear where did that concept come from initially and, and what took you into producing um, the movie, The Portal? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I was, it was just clear as a bell that, you know, meditation had changed my life, but it made my life better. And, and what I started to see was that it was making a huge difference in other people's lives as well. And it had really morphed from this sort of spiritual enlightenment monk type practice to, hey, this is just a game changer for businesses. It's a game changer for individuals. It helps on every single level. And it's not just good for people in ashrams and monasteries to get in line, but it's actually really good for the people who have families and work in offices. And so I really wanted to mainstream this and bring it out to the world. And I thought that one of the best things that I could do to inspire people to meditate was make a movie and have a book attached to that movie, kind of like The Secret did. And The Secret inspired me in many ways because financially it was an incredible business model. But more importantly, they took a very esoteric subject matter, the law of attraction, and managed to get it into the households of the world. And I wanted to do that with meditation. So that was the starting point. And so we did research looking for six stories that had all had a really difficult time in life that had used meditation to get through that difficult time and transform their life like I had. And so that was kind of like the premise of the film. And then we wanted to have a sort of macro perspective about humanity and the collective as well. So we've got three futurists in there as well. Oh, the stories are phenomenal. And I love watching any story where we're learning someone who's come out of this, you know, vastly difficult adverse kind of environment situation whatever's happened to them in life to completely converting it to a, a totally new story when it could have gone it could have gone a lot worse it's just so beautiful to watch um i was fascinated by the character that is the ai the you know i'm um, trying to actually look into is it possible for someone who um, a robot or, or robotics to have empathy and emotions and and what does that actually look like for the future that was a really brave, I guess, um, part of the film um, and really, really interesting. What do you think the future is in that space? Well, firstly, let, we want to clarify things because Sophia, the AI robot, um, she doesn't have empathy and emotions and she never will. And that's actually a good thing. Emotions aren't one of our greatest characteristics, unfortunately. A lot of people think it's a blessing that we have emotions, but Yes, emotions give us colour and texture and these sensations and feelings, but they also keep us in a very reactive state. So if you look at someone that's, let's just say, an enlightened being that's representing a very inspiring model for what it is to be human, they're not emotionally reactive to the world. They're very present and very aware. And that's, interestingly, something that an AI robot can actually be very effective at sharing information that is going to inspire someone to change their state, um, to be more sovereign and more empowered in who they are. Emotions disempower us in many respects. And the whole point of watching Netflix is to have an emotional experience. I want that show to make me feel happy or I want that show to make me feel sad. So that thing is making me feel this way. Now we translate that into the daily life and exactly the same thing is happening because we want it to happen. I want you to make me feel this way. But then sometimes we don't want to feel this way, so then we suppress that feeling. And so this is the problem with emotions. And so AI gives us this opportunity potentially to help us rise above that and people will say, well, that's spiritual bypassing. Potentially there is some of that going on for sure. But maybe that's what needs to happen and maybe we need to be less violent, less sad, less anxious, less overwhelmed and reclaim the power of our own magnificence so that we can be in this world in a beautiful, unconditionally loving space that allows us to function clearly, be effective with our creativity in our work, but not thrown around like a cork in the ocean every time something doesn't work out our way. Thank you very much. 
So now um, the stillness movement is um, is obviously one of the most significant parts of what your body of work entails on a daily basis. Um, can you tell me all about that and, and, and what is what does this involve? What are you doing and what are your goals and intentions long term? A long term, my goal is to get a farm in Byron Bay, surf more and uh, just grow my vegetables in my orchard. <laughs> I relate to that. That sounds awesome. I'm kind of thinking more Bangalore, but yeah, yes, like the nice. area. I'll, I'll see you there at the, at the, at the farmer's market on the... <laughs> my favourite place. I love it. <laughs> yes, me too. Um, so, look, the stillness project was that I could see that most of the world's woes were coming from the current state of mind that we're in. And that if I could help shift not just my state of mind, and that's an ongoing process, so I'm still a work in progress, but also, as I'm a work in progress, help other people who are also a work in progress collectively and individually to expand their states of mind, open their hearts to be more sovereign and more free from the impacts of the world, then that's going to make the world a better place. And so my primary objective was if I, I knew that one of the things that changed people most was when they started meditating. When they're not meditating, they can still change and evolve. There's no question about it. It doesn't mean that you can't be a good person if you don't meditate because there's lots of really amazing people that don't meditate. But what I found was that when I was working with people, the staticness, the stuckness because of the code of their mind meant that they kept reverting back into old patterns and kept reverting back into old dogma and old um, constructs of the mind. We call it a vasana. And so when I got them meditating, they were transcending that egoic mind. They were transcending that code, accessing a field of intelligence and wisdom that isn't in the mind, the mind's in it. And then from that space, they start to use the mind as a conduit for that, intent, that, that sort of universal intelligence to express through them. And then they start to change their life dramatically. So the Stillness Project was really just to inspire as many people. Ideally, we put a number on it, a billion people to meditate daily. Do you, have you got any idea how close you are to achieving that? Do we know I have no what idea. Like? I actually, I completely let go of any attachment to it because at one point I was getting egoically attached to it and I thought, well, that's kind of the antithesis of what I'm trying to do and be here. So I just like, it's just a subtle intention and it's kind of part playfulness, yeah. part, part just see what happens. And if, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then I'll just grow my veggies and see how that goes. Beautiful. Okay. I'd love to ask you to guide me and in this process and on this podcast today, um, for anyone who's listening and imagine that I've never meditated in my life and I'd love to learn maybe just a minute of meditation. How would you guide me into starting that process and that journey? Well, close your eyes. Lean back in your chair. Take one deep breath into the belly. And now just let your breath settle as it is normal. Just a natural ebb and flow in and out of your body. And as it's moving in and out of your body, I want you to notice that it's moving through your nostrils. And as it's moving through your nostrils, there's a slight cooling effect around the rim of the nostril. And that's the air brushing the moisture on the skin around the rim of the nostril. And ever so slightly, it's cooling the skin. And I want you to keep your attention on that cooling skin. Just keep observing that air flowing in and out, brushing that moisture on the skin, cooling it ever so slightly. And whenever the mind drifts away and goes to explore something else, we come back to that single point. And with some discipline and some force, you're going to keep the mind on that single point. Just letting go of everything outside of you. Letting go of everything in the future or the past. And just be present on this single point. And 
And then when you're ready, you can just let go of that meditation and then slowly open the eyes. Was that really only one minute? Uh, it might have been one or two. Wow. I did, you could do that for like 10 minutes and then that would change your nervous system quite dramatically. I can absolutely tell that that is life changing even in the moment mm. and what that can even bring to a, you know, the, the rest of the day is so powerful. Um, and I hope that many, many people are going to have an opportunity to connect with you, Tom, through the power of meditation. So thank you so much. I do have a final question that I like to ask all of my podcast guests on the Wellness Warriors podcast. Tom Cronin, what does wellness mean to you? Wellness means healthy mind, healthy body that then translates into a healthy life that the things that we attract into our life are a result of our inner state. And when we, when we start to really address our inner state, that's our state of mind and our physical, mental, emotional body, then we'll start to find that the outside world will naturally start to take care of itself and be aligned with that state of frequency that we've, uh, we've, we've connected with inside of us. So wellness inside first, the wellness outside second. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me along today. Thank you for joining the Wellness Warriors podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you online with us. If you enjoyed the series, please leave your review, subscribe and follow, and we look forward to sharing many more stories with you in the future.